thank the uh, organizer for the invitation, of course, especially with Manchester, and start apologizing for all the details in this subject that I will not be able to give in half an hour, and all the people that actually are doing a terrific work around the world on this subject that I will not be able to quote properly in this short talk. So let me start with magnetors. So how we define in a nutshell what a magnetor is. So in three words, we can say neutron star with very high magnetic field. Of course, there is a world behind these few words, and this is something I hope in a nutshell I'll show you the rest of the talk. So let me start with what I call the magnetic field tree to give you an idea of which kind of magnetic field we are speaking about. If we um, take, for instance, the strongest man-made magnetic field that we can achieve on Earth, we're speaking about something of the order of 10 to the 7 Gauss. And while if you go to a typical neutron star, which is what Scott was speaking about earlier, we are speaking about magnetic fields of the order of 10 to the, let's say, between 10 to the 9, 10 to the 12 Gauss. And here, with magnetors, I would speak about sources that have, are taught to have magnetic fields around 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 Gauss, so two or three orders of magnet higher than the typical pulse. Now, of course, it's clear that those are unique test, unique laboratories where we can test uh, the knowledge on the physics we have on how matter and how plasma behave in such critical conditions and so such very high <coughs> magnetic and gravitational fields. So let's start from the beginning. Um, this is, uh, again, very briefly, how magnetars are formed with respect to a normal pulsar. This is a very a largely debated uh, question, but I will make a very long story short. So there are two main ideas. In one case, um, in one case, it's through an alpha dynamo effect, which means that when the supernova explodes, then if the proton-neutron star in the core can be spun up very fast, then there might be an alpha dynamo effect due to the convection that might bring a normal magnetic field of 10 to the 12 Gauss to a level of 10 to the 15 at birth. Another way which has been proposed is through fossil fields, which means that magnetars might come from stars, from very massive stars that already have a very high magnetic field of the orders of a few kilogauss, and we know that in that galaxy there are many of those uh, magnetic stars. Now, how do we measure the neutron star magnetic field? This is crucial to, to continue the talk, so in a very rough way, but this is the best we can do. So if you imagine you have a rotating dipole, you can somehow connect the rotational energy through uh, the Larmor formula that would give you the emission in the, of the dipole, the rotating dipole, and in this way you can somehow connect the period and the first derivative of it, so this rotation and the first derivative of it, with the magnetic field of the dipole through some, some constants, let's say, that we can at first, um, in the first approximation, consider constants like the radius of the neutron star, let's say 10 kilometers, the moment of inertia, and the angle between the rotational axis and the magnetic axis. So this is the way in which, in pulsar physics, in general, we measure the magnetic field of such sources. And this is the way we do for magnetars. Now, if I plot in a, in a diagram the periods and the period derivative of all pul isolated pulsars that we know now, which are more or less 2,000 or so, and the magnetars, you see that they, they occupy two different regions of the, of the plot. So the dots are the normal pulsar radio pulsars, the red stars on top are, are magnetars. <laughs> so, and this dashed line I show you, it's what is called the critical magnetic field, which is a magnetic field at which, which is in briefly the magnetic field at which an electron which rotates around the magnetic field lines has a cyclotron energy which equals its rest of mass, which is of the order of 4, 10 to the 13. This is somehow important. It's more a theoretical limit than something really, really observational. So this is important because there are many QAD effects like vacuum polarization and other that are taught to take place only for in fields which are above this limit. And as you see, this, this dashed line, this is the slope of, of the magnetic field's intensity through that formula. On top of it, you have very high magnetic fields. So on top right, you have things of 10 to the 15 Gauss. And as you go on the bottom uh, left, you have things that decays that with lower magnetic field, let's say the bunch of the pulsars have 10 to the 12 or so. Now how we discover the sources, so historically they were discovered 
in the first two ways, which are either through short flares, which are detected by old sky monitors in the X-rays, and in this case we were calling them SGR, soft gamma repeaters, and at the beginning they were confused with the GRBs, but then when a similar uh, event was detected from the same direction of the sky more than once, then it was clear that it was something different from a GRB. Another uh, way it's actually through the study of persistent bright X-ray sources detected in old sky surveys in the X-rays since a couple of decades, and uh, which has strong pulsations, very slow periods between, let's say, a few seconds, and um, a spectrum in the X-ray which are pretty much a thermal emission plus a non-thermal component. Now recently, in the last, let's say, five, six years, we know that those sources can be transients, so they are discovered also through the detection of transient X-ray sources that then followed up with, uh, with the X-ray telescope are shown to be actually magnetars. I think that now there is somehow a consensus on the fact that IXPs, SGR, transient magnetars, they are really speaking about the same class of objects and there are many sources which so shows the whole variety of, of characteristic and emission. So general properties, I will go very quick in here. Um, so they are very bright in X-ray, very bright in the hard X-ray band, not detected in the gamma rays yet, at least. And in some cases, they have faint optical and infrared counterpart that I will not go into in this talk, but they are also interesting. Now this is a collection of all the magnet bursts, outbursts, sorry, transient events that we have detected so far in the last uh, 10 years. You see that there are many sources. They can last from a few months till a few years, depending on the source, depending on the magnetic field of the source, depending on the quiescent level of the source. So it, has, it depends from source to source, and they decay in different manner, depending again from source. And even two outbursts from the same source can have different characteristics. But maybe the most intriguing uh, peculiarity of magnetars are the flares. There are three kinds of flares. They are, let's say, cataloged in these three kinds, but probably there is a continuum between the three. There is not, it's not really a physical difference between the three kinds. So, but of those, the most interesting ones and the most energetic ones are the last one, which are called giant flares, which are those in which, which actually are the brightest galactic events after supernova explosions, which were in a few hundreds of seconds you can emit more than 10 to the 14 ergs in energy. And I think it's very interesting, something I find very interesting to show, especially for, for a general audience, it's how those flaring events, these giant flares, do interact with the Earth, and which is the, the, how we detect actually the interaction of these flares on our, our Earth. So this is a very interesting work that has been done um, for the last giant flare that was in 2004. We expect actually the next one uh, anytime soon. So this is in the x-axis you see the time, in the y-axis there is period, so periodicity, and those are detection through the CHAMP satellite, which is a satellite dedicated to study the magnetic field of the Earth, so the ionosphere and, and many other things, and the signal that you see is actually the modulation of the is the modulation where is it of the tail of this giant flare over here. This modulation it's the spin period of the star, so each peak happens exactly at the same phase, rotational phase, and we see we can actually measure the spin period of the magnetar through the oscillations of the magnetic field of our own Earth. This is to give you an idea on which is the high energetics of this event and the radiation pressure that they have. Now, why are they magnetars? Why they cannot be, their emission cannot be explained by normal rotation power pulsars or other scenario that we already knew before knowing these sources? So for the rotation, the simple, um, the simple argument is that Luminosity, at least it was, that luminosity in the X-ray, which is here, those are magnetars, those are normal pulsars, it's way larger for magnetar than the rotational power that they have, which means that should be something else powering the remission rather than only rotation. So then people initially thought that it can be accretion. You can have a companion star, which is accreting matter that's normal X-ray binary, we know plenty in our and other galaxies, 
So material are treated on the neutral star, which is giving this strong X-ray emission. Now, why this can't be the case and it was excluded? Because through timing, the rotational frequency in the same method that Scott was, was explaining earlier of these magnetars, you can give very stringent limit of the mass of a companion star that you can have orbiting around it. And now the limits, almost for all sources, it's less than a Jupiter mass, which then would anyway have too few masses to be accreted, and so accretion cannot be um, away. There, is, there are models which actually involve accretion for fossil disk around, um, around the neutron, around these magnetars, which can be created after the supernova explosion. This is certainly a viable uh, model, but I will not have the time to get into it. So then why people thought about the idea that the magnetic field is what is powering these objects simply because if you look again at the pivotal diagram, you see that all of them have very high magnetic fields, so they have very high magnetic energy. Now how this exactly work? So how exactly the magnetic energy is emitted from these sources? This is again a very large uh, subject, so I will make I will just give you an idea in a nutshell. So the idea is that actually the magnetic field geometry of the magnetar is not exactly what is for a normal pulsar. Instead of having a, a quite a normal dipole, you might have a twisted magnetic field inside the star, frozen by the crust, and outside the star. So you have a lot of helicity in the field, and this is, of course, not a completely stable configuration. It has also a lot of side effects. For example, a twisted magnetosphere sustains a lot of electrical currents, which means that the density of electrons that you have in the magnetosphere of the magnetars, it's orders of magnitude higher than what you would have for a normal pulsar. And what does it cause? It causes that um, the twisted internal field just heaten up the crust a lot, way more than what would happen for a normal pulsar. This thermal emission gets scattered in the magnetosphere, which is fully, full, uh, plenty, has plenty of hot electrons, and this scattering, in this case, it's called resonant cyclotron scattering because it's, it's a Thomson scattering, but not on free electrons, but on electrons which are tight on magnetic field lines. So what you would end up with this is exactly a spectrum, an X-ray spectrum, which is what we see for magnetars. So a thermal emission plus a non-thermal tail due to the scattering in these very dense magnetospheres. Now, this twisted configuration is also what is causing the burst, the flares, on several time scales, from the short burst to the giant flares. This because twisted um, magnetic fields are certainly not stable. They can, an interval, at intervals, they can crack the crust, and depending on how big the crack is, you can have several kind of flares, or even the outburst, the big outburst themselves. Now, there are several works that have been going on in the last uh, few years about on how to model these outbursts in order to get information, because in principle you can get information on the crust of the neutron star, on the equation of state, on the composition, so many things. Now, this is just an example, it's just the one that I know better, of course, but there are many others, where if you, we, we see that if you actually take a neutron star crust with a certain composition, you dump 10 to the 41, 10 to the 43 Earths in a certain region, and then you relax the system, what you see is exactly a shape like this, which is exactly what an outburst of a magnetar look like. Of course, there are other parameters involved, but I don't have time to get into it. Now, what we believe so far, which is what I showed till now, it can be somehow summarized in two ways. First, magnetars have necessarily highly polar magnetic fields, which is what we knew till a few years ago. Second, normal pulsars and magnetars have two distinct classes of neutron star, two distinct wave ways of behave. Now, we now know that this is not true. In the last couple of years, there are many results that are showing that actually, first, it's not a matter of the strength of the dipole field that makes a magnetar, and second, it's not true that normal pulsars and magnetars are too distant class, and there is probably a continuum among this class. Now, I will show you a few results of the last years that actually demonstrate that we had it wrong since, since a couple of decades. I will, there are many other results, but this is the one I can show in the, in the half an hour half. So the first one, I think, very important, is the detection of radio pulsations in, in first in the in this source over here that got an outburst in 2004, and then in other two sources now we know that the EMIT has some, some 
let's say, we can say has radio pulsars. Now this is important, first because we thought uh, before that magnets were totally radio quiet, we thought that a magnetic field such high has the critical magnetic field, you can have photo splitting, you have several effects that would quench the, the radio emission as we believe it, it was as a, for a normal pulsar. So this is the first step toward, I would say, somehow a connection between the radio pulsar population and magnetars. Now, we now know actually with a few sources, we now know that all magnetars showing radio emission are, funnily enough, have a, a rotational energy which is while in quiescence, while in X-ray quiescence, which is larger than their X-ray emission. So are those stars over here? So you see that it's very interesting that they somehow fill up a region in this plot where you can somehow say that there should be something rotational powered in their emission, and it might be actually that the radio emission that we are seeing from them has actually somehow the same physics as a normal radio pulsar, although it is supposed to pass a magnetosphere, which is very different from what it is or a normal pulsar is filled with, el with electrons with the twisted magnetosphere, which means that at the end, the radio emission might be somehow different in, in, uh, in characteristic, but the principle, so the acceleration of particle behind it, it might be exactly the same as a normal pulsar. Now, another very interesting result is the discovery of bursts, magnetar-like bursts, from something that was believed to be a normal, uh, let's say energetic and somehow magnetic, but let's say normal, young, Pulsar. This is the source over here, which is in a very bright and very well studied pulsar, which showed outburst and burst as a normal magnitude. And this is has a rotational energy, which is 200 times the X-ray energy, so it's definitely rotational dominated, at least while uh, not in outburst in my other way of saying. So while in the last uh, couple of years, another interesting result in this respect it's the discovery of the source, which at the first glance was appearing as a normal magnetar. You see the typical burst, you see the outburst, this is flux that is decaying, the cooling of the, the surface, typical of a normal magnetar burst. But the interesting part came from the timing again. So timing the source for almost a couple of years, we found no detection of a period derivative, which translated in a magnetic field through the formula I showed you earlier means that this magnetar should have had, should have a magnetic field which is lo lower than 7.5 to 12. So certainly in the middle of the of the let's say radio pulsar population. Now this is one new slide that maybe the, the only new result I can show in here, which is that we finally actually have probably the detection of the magnetic field of it, which is 7, 10 to the 12, so we can actually place it in, um, in the pivot orbit diagram properly. And also, now we have another source, which is not as low as this one, but still it's pretty low with respect to the bunch of magnetars. That, so something, it's saying that continuing catching transit magnetars, we are starting to fill this region of the of the pivotal diagram, which are old magnetars and which has a lot of connection with normal radio pulsar, at least from a magnetic field point of view. Now, is this all still compatible with the magnetar model? So does the detection of radio emission in, in, in magnetars of a normal pulsar showing burst of a low magnetic field magnetar still fits in what the magnetar model is saying? So at the first glance, I would say yes in the sense that in principle, but one thing that we understood now, it is not just the strength of the magnetic field, which is important in this, in this uh, matter, in showing or not various flares and magnetar behavior, but it's also the geometry of it, and it's also the different <laughs> components of the magnetic field. The cross of magnetic field can be way higher than what is the dipolar one that we measure. So in this respect, I want to show just a few simulations just to to um, because they're nice. So on top left, you see this is the thermal evolution of a new, the thermal evolution of a normal pulsar. The white lines are the dipolar field. The colored lines are the the toroidal field in the crust. This is a slice of the crust. So red, it's going out, and the yellow is going in. So you see, this is the decay over more or less one mega year of what the magnetic field of a normal pulsar, how the magnetic field of a normal pulsar would decay. 
And this is a pulsar normally, which is, was at birth with 10 to the 13 in the deep water and 10 to the 14 in the toroidal thrust of it. Now, if you look at what, if I can do it, if you look at what a, a very active magnetar would do, this is the evolution that you see. There is a lot of instability, a lot of movement in the toroidal field and in the polar tube in time. And this is what is causing flares, bursts, and all these kind of properties. Now, if we have an intermediate object, something which is not as high as an active magnetar and old, and, but not as low as a normal pulsar, which is something of this kind, this is what can, be, can explain this low field magnetar. Because as you see, maybe we should wait a bit, at the beginning there will be some, some bursts and, and, and flares in the first, let's say, few kilo years, but then when you get at uh, hundreds and hundreds of kilo years, the dipolar field starts to decay in a very stable way, which is what would reach 10 to the 12 Hz, hence for the low field magnetar, but there will be still some instability in the crust of field, which is the, the colors that you see, also at late times, which is the outburst we probably have, we have detected now from this object. Now, to start concluding, I can change the slide, can I? Yes. Uh, of course, this means that there are many, um, if you can somehow decouple the crustal field from the dipolar field that we measure, we don't see the crustal field, but we measure only the dipolar one, which means that many pulsars can somehow hide a magnetar inside, that tomorrow or whatever can start out getting outburst or bursting, and then we recognize that there is a strong field inside. And this has many consequences in general in many fields of research from the supernova explosion, which is, should cope with creating cores which have 10 to the 15 gauss for most of the pulsars with gravitational background, which, um, which actually it's certainly underestimated if you create magnetar more frequently than what you would, GRBs in the same way, and massive stars if we believe that those sources Come, the high magnetic field comes from a fossil magnetic field from these massive stars, means that they should be way more numerous than what we told before. Now, just to conclude, I hope I convinced you, let's say, of three main things. First, that magnetars are very intriguing objects and very interesting, and are perfect laboratories, a unique laboratories to study the, the, what happened to plasma and matter under very extreme condition. Second, that I think we finally understood that it's not just a matter of strength, it's not just a matter of how powerful is the magnetic field, but also geometry and the evolution of it takes a very strong role in it. And also that many normal pulsars might actually be hiding in magnetars inside and they can burst whenever we just have to wait a bit. So I would like to finish showing a bit a lighter thing, but I think it's very interesting. This is a video that has been, it's a research that has been done by these two researchers, which are two cognitive psychologists. Now, there are, I would like you to see the video and then I will explain it. So there are two teams, three people with a white shirt and three with a black shirt. And each team is passing some, some passing a ball to each other, to one another in the same team. So I would like to ask you to count how many times the white shirt people are passing the ball one another. Okay, so probably you will have several numbers. Well, the answer is, I think, 15 or something like this. 14 or 15, I don't remember, but that's not the point. So this is a test of what is called inattentional blindness, because probably most of you did not see the gorilla in it. Now I'll play it again, and please do not count the, the ball, but just focus on the gorilla.
So I think this is a very nice demonstration of how our mind sometimes works. And actually this is something I found it very inspirational because, um, well, because sometimes we are, so we have uh, a task and we are looking to the task and we just miss the gorilla passing in front of us when in our research. And I believe actually, at least in, in my field, I believe actually we are ready now to catch the gorilla and find a big picture of it. Thank you. Thanks, Nana. That's great, especially the last bit. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Um, question on the front here. So, for the classical magnetars, do we have any direct measurements of the magnetic field? Do we have any direct measurements of the magnetic field for the classical magnetars? For the class, you mean? Well, for the pulsars, as you showed, you can get a cyclotron line. Ah, from cyclotron lines. Well, there any, are some... Any method. Yes, well, cyclotron lines would be, would be the best method. There are a few claims, but all of them, one of them I published, but all of them, let's say, are barely significant, I would say. So we cannot really give an answer on this. On top of it, there is an uncertainty, which, which means that without a polar magnetometry in the X-ray, never be able to tell if the cyclotron line is due to electron or protons. So you are in the same, you have a 2000 difference in magnetic field, which is the ratio of the masses. So even if you find a cyclotron line and you can really say that it's very significant, you will not be able to tell if it's electron or proton line. So you will not be able to tell if the field is 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 15. So. Uh, any questions over, over here? Uh, one right at the back there. Hey, Nanda. Where are magnetars born on the PP dot diagram? Where are they born? Where are they born, yeah. I would say over here. That's what I would say. Uh, Renzi? Yes, um, uh, magnetar can help us uh, understand many uh, observations. It's sure, but uh, what could be the um, prediction you think uh, to be a solid and a clear evidence for, for magnetar in the future? For magnetar in the future, you mean? Uh, prediction. So you mean which would be the clear, uh, definite answer whether there is such strong magnetic field? I would say a cyclotron field line measured through X-ray polar imagery. Then but it know. depends on the electron or proton uh, uh, origin. It's uh, uncertain. Yeah. 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 Behind you. No, 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 behind you. <laughs> um, so at the very beginning, you mentioned that the, the magnetic field exceeds the, um, the quantum critical value. Does that mean the breakdown of Maxwell description of the magnetic field? So all, um, at the very beginning, yes. you mentioned that the, the magnetic field uh, is larger than the quantum critical value. Yes. Does yes. that mean we need a quantum <coughs> lecture, lecture dynamical theory to describe the magnetic, or, or we just use the Maxwell equation? No, yes. In principle, yes. You need to take in account for many quantum properties. So you would have like vacuum polarization, you wouldn't care if you have a 10 to the 12 gauss, but you would. And this is, for instance, important for, for cyclotron lines, what you would you have if you are above the quantum critical limit. Yes. So what's the implication of the quantum physics here? Well, the implication is, let's say, well, what we know is that there are magnetars which actually do not exceed the quantum critical limit and emit has magnetars. <coughs> this is what I showed you, the new results. So. The implications, I mean, the quantum critical limit is somehow a theoretical limit which, over which we know that a plasma would behave somehow, will have additional uh, physics that we have to add. That's it, I would say. It's not really a limit that you say, let's say an observational limit, this is what I'm Okay, well, let's uh, thank Nanda again for a great talk.